Okay, today we will uh, keep talking about ROP a little bit. Then we move to uh, heap attacks, heap corruption. Then after that, we will talk about uh, cache side channel attack, which is a little bit lower layer than software security problems. So far, we have been talking about uh, software. So, um, well, it's still software. I'm, I'm, so far, we've been talking about the memory corruption vulnerabilities. So in cache, we move a little bit down to the CPU microarchitecture architecture level to say um, some very serious um, vulnerabilities discovered in the last uh, five years, actually. OK, so today we keep talking about ROP. Then we also talk about how do we defeat ROP. Uh, this is still, ROP is still a very uh, useful exploitation method uh, in the wild. And uh, there has been a lot of research going on talking about how to defeat this. Um, like other approaches, um, we talked about to defeating other attacks. Uh, some of them are not practical. Uh, they are good in theory, but they are too expensive. The performance overhead is too high, so they are not practical. Uh, we will look at it. So here we have another example. I'm not going to show you the demo of the example, but uh, uh, you will do this one um, in your homework. So this this is an interesting um, Rob challenge I I designed for you. So let, let, let me explain a little bit how it works. So you can see that there is uh, a main function. The main function called Valfu. Uh, Valfu uh, takes one argument, uh, which is an integer i, but the function doesn't really use this integer. Okay. Uh, then inside Valfu, there is a local variable buffer, 200 bytes. Uh, then the Valfu opens a file, which is temp exploit, which means this one doesn't take input from std in. You need to put your exploit into this temp file. Uh, after that, it will read 190 bytes. So uh, at least uh, here, we don't have any buffer overflow, right? We don't have any buffer overflow here. However, after that, what the program does is it will take whatever your input. First of all, this is a 32-bit version. Um, so whatever your input is, take the first, first four bytes and move that to the return address. So basically, it will help you overwrite the return address here. This is what these two lines does. It will um, help you. So that's why I define an I here. I define I so I can easily find out the return address without write assembly code. Um, then after that, I will move another four bytes in your buffer. So the first four bytes go to the return address so you can't control the return address but you cannot control beyond the return address. You cannot control the save the EBP. And after that, another four byte in your buffer, in your input, will be moved to EAX. That's it. It will move to EAX. So your job is to uh, exploit this one, uh, try to get the um, flank from this one. So. How you approach this is you need to use a special gadget, uh, which is the stack pivot gadget. So basically, you're looking, you looking for the exchange instruction in a memory. So it's an exchange uh, EAX uh, 32 bit. So you're looking for EAX. So it will exchange EAX with uh, ESP. It will replace that, uh, repl uh, swap those two. So I mentioned last week, this exchange instruction is used in the OS to build um, um, uh, those locks. So what you can do here is you can control EAX. So after that, after you control EAX, you return to a gadget. Then you can swap EAX with ESP. So you are not controlling the original stack, but you can control, you can put any memory 
as your new stack. So still you are controlling the stack, right? Now after that, on the new stack, you can put your uh, ROP exploit there. So this ROP exploit could be almost the same as your previous, uh, the, the, your last homework's last um, uh, question. You basically can reuse the same exploit. You just need to figure out the first several, maybe eight bytes, how it works. So there are many places you can use as a new stack. You can use this buffer as your new stack. You can use an environment variable as a new stack. Or either way will work. You just need to pivot the stack to a new place. Okay, so this will be your uh, homework. So I give you a little bit uh, template here. Uh, so because this one is 32-bit, uh, the less than sign means this is little endian, so it stays the same as the previous one. Uh, however, we are not using Q here, we are using uh, I, which is integer, means this is four bytes. Previously, 64 bytes, we are using Q, means it's eight bytes. Uh, then you just uh, need to figure out how this part works, then maybe you need to change your uh, share code, uh, exploit a little bit. Okay, so that's part of your homework this week. So you can see that in ROP, what we are doing is we are overwriting the return address. We're still trying to, attacker still tries to control the stack, overwrite a return address. So a return address is a code pointer. We keep using the word code pointer, okay? There are many code pointers uh, on the memory. A function pointer is a code pointer. A return address is a code pointer. And also, there are code pointers used by jump instructions. By jump instructions, call instructions, and return instructions, right? So basically, there are three different instructions they can take some data or address from the memory and use that as a target destination. Um, so ROP is the first discovered. Then obviously quickly people realize if we can do ROP which exploit the return instruction, then I can also exploit the indirect jump instruction and also exploit uh, the indirect call instruction. Uh, that's why uh, there has been papers to general generalize ROP to uh, COP, core-oriented programming, and also uh, JOP, jump-oriented programming. So they, they, they all were, papers were published in good places, but uh, they were not the first one, so not as important as the first one. So um, as long as um, it's more important to do from zero to one instead of from one to a thousand in research, right? So uh, in this class, we're not covering those, um, but the basic idea is very similar. However, they have their own tricks. Uh, so how do we defeat this kind of uh, attack? So this is um, uh, another exercise I want you guys to do. Um, I said it before, when you think about, when you think of an attacker, uh, you try to list all the conditions you need to pull off this attack. Then you change to a white hat. Then you try to cross each of those conditions. And by cross out each condition, you can come up with a new defense. Even though those defense may not be perfect, but it can somehow um, delay this attack. So let's see how, so far, the, the tag we are using, uh, how, what kind of conditions do we need to, to pull this off? Uh, first, we still need to control the stack. We need to control at least one return address on the stack. We probably don't need to control the full stack because we already say that there is a, a pivot, stack pivot gadget. But still, we has to, need to control the first uh, uh, return address. Um, then uh, we, don't, we do not need to inject the code there. That's the beauty of this. This is a, 
a code reuse attack, not a code injection attack. Uh, third, there must be enough gadgets in the address space. If there, is n they, there are, are not the gadgets you want, you cannot chain them together to do what you want. But we say that at least the libc already gave us like 10,000, no, 100,000 uh, gadgets. Can do a lot of things. Uh, then we need to know the address of the gadgets because we put the address there, we go to that. We need the address, that's very important. Uh, also, to, to really use those gadgets, the, those gadgets are not necessarily instructions already exist in the memory. They probably be just uh, several bytes in the middle of an instruction. So our execution should be able to execute from anywhere. So originally, that address is not an instruction where one instruction starts. It's a middle, but we still, we should be able to execute it. But when you think about this thing, as if you are a compiler designer, you are a computer um, CPU designer, your CPU should not be able to execute in from those places, right? But um, as a general CPU, it does. So how do we uh, defeat uh, ROP, COP, or JOP? Uh, the first idea is um, the one we are already familiar with, the, the shadow stack, because you still need to take control of one return address. And the shadow stack forbids the attackers to do that. But the shadow stack only cares about the, the backward edge. So consider there is a control flow graph. It shows where the control goes. Then a core instruction, a jump instruction, that is called a forward edge in the graph. The return is called a backward edge in the graph. So shadow stack actually only protects the backward edge. Then we also need to protect the forward edge. Then there is a more, gener more um, generic approach. It's called control flow integrity. Uh, from the name, you can say that. This is a very, it's a very um, generic term. It's maintain the integrity of all the control flows, no matter it's forward, no matter it's uh, backward. So this is paper was published in 2005, also in CCS. Uh, 10 years later, got test of time paper award. Um, in this paper, they proposed a forward edge security and also proposed the shadow stack. So shadow stack was part of this paper. So uh, several weeks ago, we talked about shadow stack, but we didn't talk about this paper. It was published here. Then uh, what is uh, CFI, or especially what is forward CFI? So CFI is, you can say this is a security property. Uh, like uh, there are other security properties, there are confidentiality, integrity, availability, right? Those are property. So this is about integrity, but it's not about code integrity, it's not about data integrity. It's about the control flow integrity. So it, this um, property restricts the control flow of a program to only valid uh, execution uh, traces. So how do we define what is valid? That's actually the hard part. So even right now, that's a very hard part. So CFI in theory is perfect, but how do you define the perfect um, uh, control flow? What are the valid control flow? That's very hard. So, so for a lot of uh, instructions, we're saying they are uh, direct calls, direct jumps. So when I say direct, it means there is a call, uh, fixed address, jump to a fixed address. The fixed address can be a relative address, can be an absolute address, not, not matter, but that's a fixed one. Then those are the code. So the code section, you don't have to change them after the program is loaded. So as long as the attacker cannot change the code, so that part, that jump, that core is secure. You cannot really exploit that. However, there are many indirect jump, indirect cores. There are core EAX. There are jump EAX. So for those instructions, and also return, because return retrieves the target from the stack. For those instructions, the destination is calculated at the wrong time. So when you compile the program, you don't really know what is the destination. So, but to enforce CFI, you have to know before the program runs, those are the valid 
those are the legit destinations, right? Uh, that's why a lot of program analysis efforts were put into this, try to um, define a relatively small, those are the sets this core can go to. Uh, this is a set that jump can go to. Then CFI will assume for each jump, in, indirect jump, indirect call or return, there is a, a, a set, a valid set of destinations. Then at the runtime, the CFI will monitor the program and compare its destination with the valid destinations. Uh, if it finds out an invalid destination is used, then it will just crash the program. So most of the CFI mechanisms, they have uh, two components. Uh, one is uh, the analysis component that tries to recover that control flow graph, that valid set of destinations for each function call. Then it has a runtime enforcement mechanism to uh, check if the destination is in that set. So uh, in my lab, actually, we do research on this area. Uh, we uh, we uh, implement and design new CFI techniques on very low-end uh, devices. Uh, I already talked about what is uh, indirect call, indirect jump, so I will uh, skip this one. So let's see one example. Um, this is from a blog uh, written by a very good uh, researcher. Uh, actually, I talked with him two days ago in CCS. So he has this blog introducing what is CFI, so you can take a look. Um, this is about forward CFI. Let's say we have uh, this C code. In this C code, we have um, one function called uh, foo. Uh, in this function, there is a function pointer, uh, func C, that's a function pointer. And that function pointer is on the stack, right? That func C, that's on the stack. That's a local, that's a local variable. Uh, then after that, uh, we take some user input. Uh, if the user input is some magic, then we will set that local variable to a predefined function, a bar. Uh, otherwise, we set func to a bus, a different function. So you can see that technically here, when you read it, when human read this code, you know either bar or bars would be valid destination for the function, right? But it should, be, should not be something else in this case. Then we are going to call the function uh, using just a func there. So different CFI policies will have different um, precision here. When us, human read this, we think the valid, the, there should only be two valid targets. It should be either bar or bars. Any other address should not be valid. But it's not easy to get those kind of a precision at a compiler level. Uh, that's why, or, or sometimes you can get that precision level, but it, your, uh, your protection will be very slow. Uh, so what we do is some of the policy will say, uh, for that function call there, if you jump to, you, you call into any function in this address space, it will be considered as valid. So all those four addresses, uh, four functions, their addresses will be valid target. This, this obviously is not perfect, right? Because you see, we, we never call bus or bus there. Uh, but this will be easier to implement. Uh, or the second choice is, all functions with a correct prototype, uh, as long as it doesn't take any parameter, it returns void, so when we're, we, we will think that's valid. That's the second approach. The third approach is only the address taken functions are allowed, like bar or bus. But that requires complicated program analysis, and also um, the overhead will be, the runtime overhead may, may also be high. Then, what a CFI does at a runtime is before the function call, we are going to instrument the check CFI forward. It will be several instructions. You see that in shadow stack, in stack cookies, we are instrumenting some instructions, right? So for the forward CFI, we also instrument 
some instructions to, uh, to check the target. Uh, then after that, we will have a backward check. That is basically the shadow stack part. So um, like I said, shadow stack was part of CFI. But the shadow stack is better than, you may, you may already get a feeling here. Shadow stack will be very accurate, very price, precise. But the forward one is not. Okay. So that's how uh, CFI works. So CFI has been implemented in some compilers, uh, GCC forward CFI, uh, GCC LLVM uh, all started to support uh, forward CFI, but not on all the platforms. And the policy they are using are more like the first one or the second one. So it's not very precise, uh, but still it's, um, it's moving forward. Then the second approach to defeat ROP, a very useful one is uh, address space layout randomization. Uh, as you can see that, this approach is very useful. So far in our class, only one week we disable that, so you can hack, right? So this is a, this, so far this is still a very useful approach. It can make uh, a lot of attacks very difficult to pull off. It's still possible, you saw that. Uh, you can bypass, but it will make things much harder. So imagine, you are doing the raw plus the uh, last homework. It's already complicated enough. On top of that, we add address space layout randomization. It may take you weeks to write the exploit. It's still possible, but uh, um, take weeks. So with ASLR, we basically make it very difficult for the attacker to know the address of the gadgets. They have to know the address of gadgets, but the address of gadgets change. So it's hard for them to know that. Uh, it doesn't stop or prevent the attack, but make it much more difficult. A third approach, very interesting. Uh, there was a paper published uh, 13, 20, 12 years ago. The idea is to, let's remove gadgets. If there are no gadgets in the memory, how can they pull this off? They can't, right? Uh, this approach is not very good because it can only defeat ROP. But uh, what if you do not use ROP? You use job, you use COP, you can bypass ROP, right? So the idea is to remove gadgets. So wh what are gadgets in ROP? Gadgets are several instructions end with a return instruction. So if there is no return instruction, there is no gadgets. The return instruction is very important. The return instruction basically controls um, give the control back to the stack, so the stack can dispatch which instruction to execute next, right? So the return instruction is very important. So if we remove those return instructions, then there are no gadgets. And like I said last class, return instructions are basically those things. Uh, C3, CB, C2, CA, those several bytes. Uh, you already say how you can changing instructions in the share code homework. So here, the same thing. We just do not generate those bytes in our code, uh, not, e not even in the data part. If there is a, a let's say, an instant, a, a immediate value with C3, then we change that. Maybe we change to C2, then add one, something like that, right? So um, my example. So there are C3, C2, CA, CB. Let's say we have one instruction, which is jump to a relative address uh, C8, something like this. And uh, after this one compiled, we get those five bytes, E9, C3. The problem here is C3. So instead of generating this kind of uh, code, uh, the compiler we're not, the compiler will not generate um, to uh, C8. Instead, it will generate uh, C9. Then there is a lop instruction. So generate some equivalent instructions and getting rid of uh, those sensitive characters, bytes. So the same idea you used in the share code uh, example. Another one, uh, let's say we add C2 to EAX. Uh, here we have a C2, we just uh, change that. We change to uh, add C1 to EAX, then we increase EAX again. 
So by doing this, we remove C3 or and C2, then there is no return instruction. Next one the same, say A, we're doing uh, exclusive or, we just uh, um, generate some equivalent code. Okay, so this is uh, another idea. Uh, you see, this is not a, this is not a perfect idea. Right? It's, uh, as long as you did a share code homework, you know I can't come up with some idea like this. But still, I mean, uh, it has value in the research community. It's not perfect, but it has value. So doing, doing security research is not that uh, difficult, okay? So I, I hope this kind of examples give you, give you some, com, com, some kind of confidence that uh, you can, after taking this class, you can also do research in uh, security. Uh, just more examples there. So this one basically try to uh, remove the gadgets in the address space. Then another one is called uh, uh, monitor CFI. Uh, so this one is kind of like uh, a little bit of machine learning based approach. So we look for the patterns. So you see that in a secure or normal code execution, we are going to execute many functions. So those functions, some of them are smaller, some of them are bigger, uh, but even the small functions, usually you will have several instructions, then a return instruction. You're not going to have like one, ins one useful instruction, two useful instructions, then a return. The frequency the return instructions choose it's not that high, right? That, that's normally the code we generate. But in ROP, you already say that. We, um, for example, the last homework, you probably used like 10 or 15 gadgets there. And each gadget, there are at most two, three, four valid instructions. After that is a ROP, that is a return. So the frequency the return instruction shows up is really, really high, right? So this approach is saying, uh, we are going to utilize the CPU tracer. So most of the CPU right now, the, your phone, uh, very low end IoT devices, uh, those kind of uh, desktops, the CPU has a tracing feature. It will trace all the instructions it executes, store that in another memory region. So in a buffer. The, this approach is we do not instrument the code to be executed. We just examine the trees. We say how many times, how often the return instruction uh, shows up. If it's above some kind of a threshold, then we say there is a ROP attack, okay? So still, this is not directly tackling the root cause of the problem, but it could be a very, um, this could be a very uh, cheap solution because you are using a hardware tracer. The hardware tracer doesn't really cost, cost any CPU cycles itself. Uh, one paper published this uh, ten, exactly 10 years ago. It's called a uh, uh, K-Bouncer. Um, also, this paper, I don't, yeah, they're published from the same group, actually, from Columbia. Um, they are just using tracer to do this kind of thing. Uh, so, but this approach has a lot of issue. Is the trees were stored in a buffer. Now, who is going to analyze a buffer? Usually, you still use the software to analyze a buffer. So, you, if you use software to analyze a buffer, the software will also uh, cost a lot of uh, CPU cycles. So, that part, the analysis part, could be slow. Uh, that's why there is a very, very um, cheap, almost uh, a low cost approach. Uh, this is uh, Intel have this approach. Uh, you have been saying this instruction a lot, the end BR32, end BR64. You have seen this instruction from the beginning of the class. And uh, before I was just uh, asking you to ignore that instruction. So this instruction uh, belongs to a new Intel CPU feature called uh, CET. Um, I think CET is uh, control flow enforcement technology, something like that. So basically, this is an approach to stop 
uh, ROP. The idea here is if this CPU supports this um, feature and this feature is enabled, then all the function calls, all the, all the function calls, this is what we're talking about forward edge here. The, all the function calls have to call into an under BR32 instruction. So, so that instruction is placed at the beginning of all the instructions. And all the function call has to go there. If you call into the middle of, let's say, you call into the uh, subtract A from ESP, then uh, there will be an exception. The, CP, the program will crash. So this is also not perfect, right? Because it's possible that, so the under BR32, that's basically those four bytes. It's possible that you have those four bytes in the middle of your function, as part of your instruction, as part of your data, as part of your address. That's possible. But the chance is very low. Even if uh, those exist, um, if those exist, it give you some kind of gadgets, but uh, not many. Just uh, maybe even the whole address space will give you several gadgets. That's it. So uh, significantly reduce the chance of um, control flow control flow um, hijacking here. So those are basically um, the defense techniques we are using. Uh, some of them are already deployed in our CPU. Some of them are mainly in uh, research papers. Uh, any questions for Rob? This one? Yeah. Okay. What is C? There are three approaches. Yeah, yeah. So those are those are basically three different CFI policies. The C? C is the, the most precise one. So if you read the code, you know that. The the only two possible functions we are calling into is actually either bar or bands, right? So the precise, the most precise policy should just allow call into those functions. Any other function or any other address will not be allowed. Yeah, that's the most precise one. Yeah. Good. Okay, if no other questions for Rob, then we move to a new topic. So uh, the next topic we will talk about is uh, uh, heap ex uh, explore, uh, exploitation. Um, so heap is uh, a memory region for a program. A kernel also has its own heap, but in our class, we're mainly talk about the user space program. So if you remember this picture I showed you very first class, uh, this is without ASLR, obviously. Uh, we have the heap in the middle. Uh, the memory mapping segment, you can consider that part of the heap, actually. Um, so heap is used uh, to dynamically allocate uh, memory. So for students who took 220 here, systems programming, uh, you probably implemented a, a memory allocator in your class. So that is just a heap management, right? So you took that class? Yeah, so, so um, the heap also has a lot of uh, security issues. Uh, also, the kernel heap uh, has been uh, exploited uh, in recent years. Uh, so to use heap uh, at the user space level, to use heap, uh, we have uh, several functions, C library functions. 
uh, there, there are malloc, uh, free, and several others. So malloc will uh, grab memories for the program on the heap. Uh, if you are programming in C++, uh, you can use a new keyword, which is equivalent to malloc. Uh, free will release the memory on heap. Uh, also, the keyword delete in C++ do the same thing. So they are both standard uh, C library functions, uh, but they are not system calls. So heap are managed in the user space. So when you program that in 220, you know that it's a, it's a library in the user space. It's not part of the kernel. Uh, kernel heap is a different story. Uh, we're not talking about that. Uh, so malloc doesn't directly map to uh, any system call. Free doesn't do that. Uh, the reason is we want to manage the heap, the dynamic memory, in a very efficient way. But if we net, always need the kernel to do the job, it will be very slow. Call from the user space to the kernel is very slow. You need to do the context switch. You need to make the system call. Uh, that's very expensive. So the kernel only provides uh, the system call uh, a brick, or S brick, to give a huge chunk of memory to the program. Then the program uh, or the library of that program will manage the heap by itself. Will not never bother bother the uh, kernel again. So the system code there is just a brick and S brick. Um, the malloc free; those are just library functions. Um, so malloc will take one integer as input and uh, uh, use that integer. The programmer indicate how many bytes they want to allocate. So malloc will allocate uninitialized uh, uh, storage, memory region. Uh, if the malloc is successful, it returns the beginning of that memory you can use. Uh, if malloc is not successful, it will return just uh, zero. Then free will deallocate that uh, space previously allocated by malloc. So as a as a programmer, if you want to use this, you need to call malloc. After you are done, you are supposed to call free. Okay. So whenever I say you are supposed to do something, you know some developers will make mistakes. Okay. Um, actually, all of us will make mistakes because the program will get very complicated, multi-thread. It's hard to not make a mistake. And when, when there are mistakes like that, then you know there could be uh, security vulnerabilities. And also, there are two more uh, C library functions uh, similar to malloc. Uh, one is called uh, canloc. Uh, canloc is almost same as malloc. The only difference is it will initialize the memory uh, to zero or whatever you want, I believe. Oh, no, it's just zero. Okay. So it takes two arguments. One is the number of item and the size of the item. So it's basically number of item times the size. You get the bytes you want. Uh, the difference is it will initialize the memory to zero. Then there is another one called a uh, realloc. So if you malloc something, you have a memory region. Later, you want to change the size of the memory region. Uh, you, can, what, you can free it, then malloc again. Or you can just uh, uh, realloc. Uh, realloc is very complicated uh, because it does not necessarily create the memory region uh, at where the memory used to be, okay? because that memory region is not big enough for your new request, maybe. So it actually has to free that the malloc for you. Okay? Uh, those are the basic four functions uh, in uh, for the heap management at a C code level. So how to use this? Uh, I, I believe most of you used this before. A uh, very simple example, we have a buffer, a pointer. Uh, the pointer itself is a local variable in the main function. Uh, it's initialized to null, so it doesn't point to anything. Uh, then when we want to allocate uh, 100 hex bytes, on the heap, we just do malloc uh, 100, then uh, 100 in hex to 256. Then if it's successful, we sign that to, to buffer. Then we can uh, fget your input, then put 
the value inside the uh, buffer. So when you are done, you are supposed to destroy this by free this. For this function, for this program, this is a full program. For this program, it doesn't really matter if you free it or not. Because after, even if you do not free, the program will just return. The whole process is uh, uh, destroyed. Doesn't really matter. But there are a lot of process. They are going to run there forever, like a web server, right? They are going to run there for a very, very long time. You don't reboot that very often. So for those programs, if you malloc something and you do not free, uh, if you just uh, leak four bytes an hour, yeah, several days later, you, you, you lose a lot of memory there. So how is uh, heap uh, different from uh, stack? Uh, first of all, uh, we say that in the address space, they are at different uh, locations. Uh, but that's not the key. The key is uh, stack is fixed memory allocation uh, known at compiler time. When we have a local variable, that's on stack, right? And uh, we all say that at the beginning, the prolog of a function, we have a subtract some number to ESP. Then when we refer to that local variable, we just uh, refer to EBP uh, minus something, right? So that's a, that's a fixed address, fixed relative address uh, at a compiler time. Um, so stack stores a lot of information, uh, local variables, return address, function arguments. Um, they are uh, fast. Why they are fast? Because you see those instructions. You refer to, you want to move a local variable to a register just to move EAX, then EBP minus some fixed number. That's just one instruction. That's very, very fast, right? Only one instruction. Uh, so it actually abstract away many of a concept. Uh, how do you allocate that, deallocate that? Because compiler already uh, did the job for you. Uh, heap is different. Uh, heap is for those memory regions that you do not know how many you need, whether you need them at a compiler time. Those are determined at a runtime. Uh, your web browser, your web server get a new HTTP request, then you say, oh, I need to handle this. I need to create a new object for this. Uh, without this request, I do not need to create this. But for, so I need a new memory region for that. So, so they are dynamically um, allocated at runtime. So we can use them to create all kinds of uh, objects, like in C++, uh, also in high level, other high-level languages, or Java, or JavaScript, even JavaScript you knew an object that's on this heap. So that's why uh, heap exploration has been uh, widely used in browser. You, you, can, um, you can just write some JavaScript, send it to other people, and they, or, or host them on web, then it can exploit someone's browser. Because um, you just uh, create a project that is actually on the heap. Uh, a major difference, another major difference between objects uh, on heap and on stack is uh, objects on heap, obviously, they are persistent between functions. The local objects on stack, they are only meaningful for that specific function call, right? Um, that function could be called many times, but that local variable only is meaningful when that specific call exists. If that function returns, that local variable doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but heap objects are not related to functions. Uh, they, they stay there. Uh, and also, usually, we use heap for uh, larger memory objects and uh, use uh, stack for smaller ones. Uh, heap management is slow. It's done by a programmer using the interface. Uh, so you can see why, that, why this is slow. Let's say previously you need a four local variable, like I said, just one instruction. Now if you need another four bytes, you need to call into the malloc function. That's a function call. And a malloc does a lot of things. That's probably 2,000 instructions there. But a local variable is just one instruction. That's why 
heap will be much slower. So there are, because heap is not a kernel implementation, it's just a library, there has been many different uh, implementations. Uh, the one right now we are using on our server, and uh, most of your, uh, if you are using Mac, I'm not sure, so if you are using Linux, we're actually using ptmalloc. Uh, ptmalloc is the library we are using, and the ptmalloc is based on something called a DL malloc or dog Lee malloc. Um, uh, he probably was a professor at uh, the university. He implemented that, then uh, Linux borrowed that in the C library. Uh, the one we are using right now, PT malloc, is also extended from the original uh, DL malloc. Uh, so in this class, uh, especially next class, we will go deeper into uh, DL malloc to see how it is implemented. Uh, the original DL malloc is not uh, thread safe. The PT malloc and support for multi-thread. Uh, there are also uh, a lot of, uh, uh, many other implementations. Uh, for example, the last one. Uh, the hold memory annotator uh, that's developed by a professor uh, Emery Berger from UMass uh, Amherst. Uh, he developed this. Uh, and it's very easy for you if you want to use a different uh, uh, heap implementation. In Linux, you just use a preload something, then you run your program. Then you are going to use a new uh, memory annotator instead of the C library memory annotator. Um, Google has their own uh, implementation. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know where this is used. Probably this is used in Android. Um, uh, also, we have uh, uh, Gmaloc. So anyway, there are many of these. Uh, some of them focus on performance, try to be as fast as possible. Uh, some of them focus on uh, security. Um, uh, Linux usually always go for the performance the best performance one. Okay. Uh, so for example, on my laptop, uh, what I can say is I use LDD, then I can say the version, then I can check the what C library I'm using, uh, then we find out I'm using ptmalloc2, and uh, uh, we just go to the G C library code, then we can, you can check the source code of the malloc or the, the heap management. Okay, let's, today we'll talk about uh, the overview of uh, DR malloc. Next week we'll go deeper. Uh, this is uh, the version uh, Linux is using. Uh, the PT malloc, like I said, very similar to this one. Um, there are some design goals for this heap management. Uh, the first one is uh, portability. Uh, they want to rely on as few as system calls in po uh, as possible. So they can easily port this to different OS. They can port it to Mac, if they can port it to Linux, uh, port it to uh, BSD, whatever. Uh, so I believe, uh, well, you only need S-Brick, S uh, Brick, not many other system calls. The uh, minimal, minimizing spacing. Uh, the, malloc, the allocator should not waste too much uh, memory. It should not uh, generate too, mu too many uh, fragments. Um, also, it should be super fast. Uh, for Linux, that is always, the performance is always uh, one of the most uh, criteria they look for, uh, should be fast. Uh, also, maximizing uh, locality. So to allocate different memory chunks, uh, they are usually uh, together near each other. Uh, this can help the CPU and also the cache to um, make things faster. Uh, we will talk about this next, I think uh, two weeks later, we will talk about uh, cache, then we will talk about how CPU works uh, and uh, why we put things together will make uh, your program run faster. It will have some kind of error detection, but obviously, since we're talking about this in a security course, you can say uh, there are a lot of issues here. It's not, it's not really secure. Uh, then, Let's see our first example of uh, uh, malloc. So let's say we have uh, four malloc calls. 
and uh, if we run this on our system, how many bytes on the heap do you think uh, each, so each malloc will return a memory region. So how many bytes do you think each region will, will really take up? The first one, the programmer request 32 bytes. The second one, four bytes, 20 bytes, 10 bytes. Okay. Uh, zero bytes, actually zero bytes. You can, you can do malloc zero, actually. Okay. It's a little bit strange, but you can do that. Um, you cannot do malloc of minus one because the argument is size t, which is unsigned. So if you do minus one, it will be translated into a huge number, the positive number, right? So, so do you want to guess how many? First of all, do you think if you request a 32, you will get 32? Or you will get maybe more than that? Or you will use more than that? Yes, you will, you will use more because of metadata. So that's, that's another thing about a heap. If you are doing this on stack, you don't, for each local variable you are allocating, you don't need metadata for it. But for heap, you will need metadata to, um, for the allocator to manage this. So let's see one example here. We have, um, we have a main function, and in the main function we have an array of uh, integers. Those are the sizes of uh, 10 malloc's we are going to make from 32 to 4 to 0. Then the, after we do the malloc, we save the returned address into the pointer, which is a uh, array of 10 pointers. Then we print out, uh, for each malloc, we print out first it's the length, how, much, how many bytes we are requesting, we print out uh, where is the memory we get. Uh, then we calculate the difference between the previous malloc memory region and the next malloc region. So if we run this program on our server, uh, heap size, so we're going to heap now. Heap size, let's do 32 bit. We just run this program. This is 32 bit, so size t is four, bit, four bytes. Uh, pointer is also four bytes. Then let's say the first malloc we make is malloc 32, and uh, we get this address. The second malloc is malloc of four, and you can see from malloc the, the return of malloc 32 to the return of malloc of four, there are actually 48 bytes. We are requesting 32 bytes. We get, uh, we get 48 bytes. So that 48 bytes include the, f the buffer you get for the first malloc and also the metadata for the second malloc. Because what a malloc returns is what the user can use. The metadata is actually in front of that. So this is the metadata for the second one and the metadata for, um, and the buffer for the first one. Uh, so the metadata for the second one is actually 16 bytes. So we, let's assume they are adjacent to each other. Let's assume the allocator does a very good job. So it's not wasting even one byte. So they are all together. Then the buffer will be 32 bytes, then 16 bytes of uh, metadata that will be 48 bytes. So later I will show you why it's 16 bytes. Uh, then the second malloc here is um, uh, we're requesting four bytes, and uh, this one will be 16 bytes. Should be 16 bytes? Six bytes to the next pointer. Huh, this one is a little bit weird. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on this one. This calculation is correct here. Uh, I need to debug a little bit to figure out this one. Because this one it looks like it's not really taking any space, right? It's all 16 bytes for metadata. Same as this one, zero. All 16 bytes for the metadata for the next one. It's not really having any buffer here. Okay, so I need to debug uh, this one just to see what's going on. 
so this one you can say 64 bytes plus 16 will be 18. So all others will be 32 plus 48 bytes. So for the 64-bit version, Sixty-four bit version, almost the same thing. Just the metadata will not be sixteen bytes anymore. Um, oh, so in this case, it's still sixteen bytes. Yeah. So most of them are the same, sixteen bytes of metadata. Okay, let's go back to our slides. Um, so. Uh, what happens is um, every time you call malloc, the allocator will give you a memory chunk. And that memory chunk includes the buffer for the user to use and also metadata. Right? So if the allocator is well designed, it doesn't waste, any, um, doesn't waste many bytes. So those chunks should be uh, next to each other from lower address to higher address. Uh, so here we will have uh, 10 different chunks uh, adjacent to the next one. Each of them suggests the next one. So this is uh, one of the, it really takes up. So this is the definition of the uh, malloc chunk, uh, the, the C library I'm using. Yeah, you can say uh, this, is a, this is a header, a chunk, this one doesn't really have the uh, data part. It only has a meta data, meta, meta information here. Uh, the first one that is called a, a M chunk previous size uh, for 64 uh, for 32 bit. This is four byte, the same as size T. Uh, the second one is the size of this chunk, uh, including the buffer and also metadata. Then there is a pointer. Uh, to link the to link the uh, freed chunks, the free chunks are using a double link to link together. So the allocator can easily figure out uh, where I should allocate uh, new chunks. And then this one, I believe, is um, uh, this should be unions. Uh, so the code I'm pasting here probably has some. Uh, it's not the best one. Uh, let me show you show the figure. Okay. This is what a heap chunk look like. When you do malloc, what you get is this address here, the data address or the buffer address. This is what you get. But what the allocator really allocate is this whole thing with uh, the uh, headers, the metadata. So in this case, the metadata, uh, this, is a, this is a chunk in use. Uh, we're using this one. Then the metadata here is the previous chunk size. Uh, then it has its own size. So for, for each chunk, uh, it has to be uh, at least eight bytes, or because of the metadata here, right? Uh, or also, uh, you should be uh, you should be aligned eight bytes. Uh, so that's which means the ad, the size part, the last three bit bits doesn't really matter. So last th that's why we use the last three bits for flags. So the flags indicate um, whether this chunk uh, is in use uh, and uh, how this chunk is created. For example, uh, if this flag is one, it means this chunk is in use. Otherwise, this chunk is not used. Uh, then there is uh, also, if this flag is uh, two, it means this chunk is actually created by the system call memory map. Uh, this chunk is not created by malloc. Okay. Uh, that's why I say memory map actually is very similar. It's also on a heap. Um, uh, also, there are some other, there is a lot of flag. Uh, which is not that important for us there. So here you can see, this is what you should, uh, th the takeaway for this slide is the buffer, the, when you do a malloc, the address you get is only the address to the buffer. That's where 
you get the memory, you can use this memory. You never think about before that, there are actually metadata. And those metadata are very important. Okay. So uh, if the chunk is not in use, let's say uh, in this figure, we have uh, three chunks. Uh, they, are, uh, they are linear there. Uh, the A, A, B, C. Uh, in this case, the the memory, the memory, the, the lower part is a higher memory. Okay, so chunk A is uh, the chunk we are using right now. We are about to free free it, but right now it's still in use. So when it is in use, the structure looks like that: four bytes of previous chunk size four bytes of its own size, then use the data, okay? Then chunk B is already free. We're not using it. So chunk B's data structure is a little bit different because technically we don't have to use the data anymore, right? We're not using it. User is not using it as a store data. So we use there to store more pointers, the forward pointer, the backward pointer, to link all the three chunks together. So we still have the previous chunk size and uh, current, front ch current chunk size. And also, there is one bit saying um, this, the previous chunk is in use, not the current one. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's got, yeah, I said that part wrong. So here, the flag, the flag, the first, uh, when it's one, it's not saying the current chunk is in use. It says the previous chunk is in use, okay. Uh, so after that, you, you will have this um, forward pointer and backward pointer, which is defined here, the FT, the BK. So if, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's why, uh, the, for, for the metadata, it's actually eight bytes. That's why, uh, for this one. Oh, I, I, I missed, I said it by mistake. Previously, I said the metadata is 16 bytes. It's not, it's eight bytes. They are in use, so the metadata is eight, eight bytes. So if they are not in use, the metadata technically is uh, uh, 16 bytes. Uh, that's why this one makes sense now. Uh, it's four bytes uh, plus uh, 16 bytes. So technically they only need uh, four bytes plus eight bytes. So technically they only need 12 bytes. But for alignment, uh, the annotator actually gave 32 bytes in. So you can see that what important here is the metadata. That's the control information. Okay. So this is another case that we are mixing data with control information. Same as what was before we had at the stack. We have uh, parameters. We have local variables. We also have return address, which is a control data. Or we have saved EVP, which is control data. When we mix them together, things will go wrong. When we mix them together, if the user data can overwrite, let's say um, the, the chunk A, the user data, uh, we, if we, there is a buffer overflow, we can overflow the re user data, then we are going to overwrite chunk B's meta information, right? So we can either cause uh, lose some, uh, some, some memory leakage, or more seriously, it will lead to uh, arbitrary code execution. Uh, so one more example here. So this program print out uh, the chunk size and the metadata information. So we are creating, I don't know how many, so say, like uh, maybe 15 or something, 15 uh, memory chunks by calling malloc for 15 times. Um, the size of them gets uh, bigger and bigger. Then we print out the chunk. We're not only printing out of the buffer, we're printing out of the chunk. So the print chunk function, you can see, the input of the print chunk function is uh, where the buffer is, for each chunk, where the buffer is. So which is PTRI, that's where the buffer is. That's what usually you use. But going into that print chunk, you can see that we're, we're actually accessing PTR minus two and PTR minus one. So we are go before the buffer. So, 
So PTR is here. That's what you get from malloc. Then we are going to PTR minus two, then dereference this one. So we get the previous chunk size, then we get uh, chunk size, okay. So then we just uh, print them out. Uh, if we run this one, if chunks, So if we run this one, you can say we can't get the metadata of uh, every chunk. This is the first one, uh, the previous. So you can see in the version I'm in the version where the the heap version the heap library we are using on our server, the previous chunk size it's always zero. Okay, looks like they are not using it anymore. Uh, the size of current one is actually, so it always ends with one one because um, the last three bit, last three bit doesn't matter, it's not really the size. So this one size is actually zero, this one size is uh, 4,000, it's 4K uh, in hex, then it has the buffer's address. So this is what you get when you do malloc, and uh, before that you get uh, uh, meta information. So it looks like only the flag and the size is used. The previous one, the version we are using, it's not, it's not using it anymore. It's all just zero. But for backward com compatible, uh, it's still there. They didn't remove it, but uh, they're not using it anymore. So let's say the 64 version should be the same thing. The 64 version, you can say the same thing. Okay. So, um, uh, one more time, uh, use this figure to show that uh, the two. So if we are requesting four, right, then that would be 12, total. 12 total, yeah. Well, that depends on how this is implemented. So 16 could work, but uh, the allocator just decided to do 32, think it's faster, whatever, yeah. yeah. So, um, Two states of a chunk, uh, if it is in use or it is freed. When it is in use, uh, it has this format, uh, eight bytes, a 32-bit version, eight bytes of the meta information, then the data. Uh, if it's not in use, the same one, if we freeze that, then the data doesn't matter anymore. So uh, the, first, the first eight bytes there, we were just used uh, to create the uh, forward uh, link and backward link pointers there. So let's try another example. Uh, we are going to free those things, then we check those metadata again. Uh, we are creating five chunks. They have the same size, or 32 bytes. Uh, then the first for loop here, we print in-use chunks. For in-use chunks, we are going to use the first function, uh, the, uh, the print in use chunk function. We will print the two metadata there. Uh, after that, we are going to free all of them. So after we free, we access them again. Even though we freed those, we can still access them, right? Because this is user space. We can access wherever we want. Then we check those metadata again, but this time we know the metadata, uh, there are four different um, items 
for minor data. Previously, in use, only two. Now we have four, so we print all four of them. So let's run this one. Okay, so we malloc five times, each time 32 bytes. So when we malloc it, um, we have uh, five different memory chunks. Um, let's say the size of each uh, are, that's, that's one, that's 30. So that, that, that's 30, because that, that one is a flag. So 30 there make, make it uh, 48 bytes. So the chunk is actually 48 bytes. The after, then we free every one of those. After we free, you can see, so when, we, when those are in use, those are, this part will be user standard. So it doesn't have those pointers. When this one is not in use, we don't have user data, we just overwrite them with pointers. And you can see the pointer here, the first one, uh, the previous one was just zero. Uh, then the next one, the forward, this next one is zero. And the backward will be uh, zero, one, ten. You can see that all of them are actually the previous one is zero, one, ten. So in this implementation, for five chunks, we're not really having a double linked data structure here. All of them are kind of like going to a head. This is probably the head, right? The head will be directly linked to uh, all of them. Then the forward one will go to uh, maybe the the next chunk. So B0, uh, I'm not sure, because I'm not sure about this address. I don't remember this one. But you can see the forward one is different. So this is not really a double linked data structure. Uh, this is a, this could be a, this is maybe a tree structure. Yeah, so, so if you need to, you want to fully understand this, you have to dig, dig into the source code to say how they implement this. Okay. So that's freeze. Okay, so the most important to take away here is, um, so I believe for most of you, before this class, you don't know how heap is uh, implemented. You don't know that there's metadata. So that's the most important takeaway. The metadata uh, can be uh, overwritten, and uh, the also there are many different implementations of heap, and to exploit them, you need a deeper understanding of how it works, how the malloc function works, how the free function works. It's it's the same as the way exploiting any other uh, box. You you need to understand what is your input, what you can control. Here, obviously, what you can control is we assume there is a buffer flow. You will be able to control other chunks metadata. But how, how that other chunks, by controlling that, you can lead to arbitrary code execution or other bugs. That depends on how the library function itself is implemented. For example, the free, how the free is implemented how re-alloc is implemented, right? If you understand that, then uh, maybe we can uh, explore that. Um, so that is something, that is something we are going to uh, dig deeper uh, next week. Uh, we are going to say several uh, heap exploitation vulnerabilities, and uh, we will look deeper at the uh, DL malloc. We will look at it's how its free function works. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Yeah, 
Yes. So the previous chunk here, well, this, this those kind of libraries has been has been updated many many times, right? So the very first version that has a previous chunk or whatever, then you can say it seems like the version we are using right now it's not really using it; it's just zero. But but the data structure stays the same, but the code may not be using that part anymore. Yeah, that that's why it looks weird there. Yeah. So next week we are going to look at the free code, then we can uh, see more details there. Yeah. Okay. If uh, there is no, if there is no other questions, I guess uh, we have a short class today. So the homework this week will be very simple. Uh, you just need to uh, run those several programs. Technically, there is no. Oh, well, you need to. Uh, you need to. Hack Rob two. Besides that, the heap one this week we don't really any we don't have any hacking assignment. You just need to play those program, try to understand the output. Okay. Other questions? Okay, good. Have a, have a short class this this week. First of all, the, we are using virtual memory, right? Yes. This is the virtual address space of a program. Uh, yes. So each each process will have a whole 4 GB of memory for 32 million versions. Each process. Each process. Yeah. yeah. So this is not a, what we're doing here is not physical memory. This is virtual memory. Oh, yeah. Right? So for each virtual, each virtual memory, each process has its own code. That will be the text segment. It will have its own global verb that will be data data segment. The, the BSS is for uninitial, usually for uninitialized global verb. So, so it's like uh, int a and then the initialized with any value. Int, yeah, int a, yeah, for example, 